bit slow. So yeah, uh, as so as we discussed earlier, uh, for the brain encoding, we are using a hidden figures movie data set. And for this uh, hidden figures movie data set, uh, since it's a movie data set, which consists of uh, uh, like a video, audio, and uh, all the text annotations are included. So for extracting features for a video, it will take a lot of time. So due to that reason, we already extracted features for the hidden figures movie data set and we are already uploaded in the GitHub repository. So people can use directly the extracted features. So here we are cloning the GitHub. And maybe I'll even go through the repository once, so where the features are located. So here we have our features.zip file is already there. So in features.zip we have the uh, video representations uh, for each TR. So we clone the uh, repository in Google Colab and uh, we tar the, uh, unzip the uh, features.zip file. And if you see in the data folder, we have a uh, figure six uh, text features like a NPY file and uh, audio uh, NPY and uh, and also we can see video NPI. So the figure movie data, um, so they have different sessions like every 10 minutes video clip. So there are total eight sessions are there for the figures movie. Uh, so for uh, you can see here like uh, figure six means it's the in the sixth session. Um, so we are extracting the features like if you say it's a figure seven. So it's in the seventh session we are extracting the features. And if you want to access the fMRI data, uh, please fill this form. So then only we can uh, release the fMRI data because uh, yeah, that is how it will be. So if you say yes, so we will uh, give the access for the fMRI. So, uh, so this fMRI data zip file, uh, it's uh, there in the Google Drive and uh, uh, we are downloading from the Google Drive and yes, we need to fill the form. Google Drive link and which contains all the fMRI data and uh, once if we download the fMRI data, it's uh, around uh, 1.59 GB, which contain all the, uh, every TR we have uh, oak cells. Um, so the, like total we have eight sessions. So in out of eight sessions, so every session we are having the TR level fMRI data is available. And uh, we unzip the fMRI data. So you can see here, so figure seven, so, um, so for one subject, uh, they have shown different movies. So for the Hidden Figures movie, it started at se seventh session and uh, they also ran different runs. For the run one, we have a uh, 91,000 oak cells, so 91,000 uh, gray ordinates and it's a uh, time series data. So for every oak cell, we have a, a, a time series is available. And these are the uh, basic import statements in uh, Python. And all the uh, ridge regression functions, these are already written in a simple Python script. So we just import uh, those Python files.
Uh, so what we did uh, out of three sessions, uh, we considered seventh session and eighth sessions data into the training and uh, ninth sessions data into the testing. So we concatenated uh, train level data as well as the test level data. So in, in session seven, we have uh, three clips and in session eight, we have a total five clips and in session nine, we have a uh, four clips. So once if we loaded the uh, train and test level fMRI data, then we need to load the uh, stimulus features. Since uh, I mentioned for the extracting video features or audio features, it will take a uh, quite amount of time. So due to that reason, uh, we are uh, providing the already extracted features. But if you are interested, if we want to extract features again, so we already provided the code here. Uh, so the code is commented here. So if you uncomment the code, then you will get the uh, features again from the starting, so the feature extraction part. And to extract the video level features, we use a MXNet library. So MXNet is also like a Keras and TensorFlow. Uh, we found it like a, in MXNet for extracting video features, it's a bit simple and uh, they have used a ResNet based model. Um, so that is the reason we followed the uh, MXNet. Yeah, so here uh, we are loading each session wise uh, clips like uh, uh, to, uh, since we have in 8th uh, uh, session and 7th session we have around uh, 9 clips. So each clip we are loading and we are concatenating the stimulus features. Similarly for the tested data as well. Now uh, we need to do TR level mapping since uh, 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 the stimulus response like uh, when the subject is uh, watching a movie, so there is a delay in uh, fMRI response. So due to that reason, uh, what we did, we consider every four TRs, uh, for the every four TRs, we expect the fMRI activation at the fifth TR. So the input to the model, we concatenated the uh, stimulus representations of four TR and the output will be the fifth, uh, fifth TR that will be the fMRI. So here, uh, if you want to predict uh, YI, we are using the stimulus representations from uh, XI minus one, XI minus two up to XI minus six. So it's like uh, 60 TRs, the stimulus representations and we are predicting the fMRI at the YI, so it's the seventh TR. And for the hidden figures movie, uh, the TR time is 1.49 seconds. So every 1.49 seconds, they recorded the fMRI. Yep. Uh, so, so the text level annotations. No, it's it's a it's a watching movie. It's not about text. Hidden figures is a movie. No, it's a just a passive watching. Like subjects are just watching the movie. Uh, down sampling thing I'll go. Okay. Yeah. I think uh, so the down sampling uh, he already written a function I think so uh, what exactly happened in down sampling um, so we can use uh, different filters like uh, Lancos is a uh, one filter we can use for the downsampling. Uh, so what will happen is like uh, at every TR, 
let's say uh, the TR is 1.5 seconds or 1.49 seconds. So in the 1.49 second, we have a uh, so that particular clip will be appeared. So what what amount of clip came in that 1.49 second? So entire duration of the video. So we have we divided the uh, each video into 1.49 clips. And uh, what we did uh, during downsampling, we need to provide the uh, four inputs. So one input is uh, TR level features. So TR level features means every clip we have a video representation. And uh, so the average, like uh, what is the starting offset and what is the ending offset. So if we take the average of the clip, so that that is the another input. And uh, the third input will be the TR time. TR time will be the 1.49 seconds. So if you provide uh, these three inputs to Lanco's filter, then it will get downsampled the representations. Uh, so that function is already there in the GitHub repository. So I think it's already done. So yeah. So because uh, we here we are not uh, doing the hemodynamic response function on the fMRI. If we can do the downsampling on the TR level feature itself, and if we concatenate, uh, like uh, if we use a uh, 60 TRs as a stimulus features, and if we predict the uh, YI is the 70 TR, so we no need to do again hemodynamic response function on fMRI. So that thing is not required here. Uh, embeddings means here we are concatenating like in the TR1 let's say uh, so the clip representation is let's say 768 dimension 768 dimension for each clip uh, suppose if I mentioned 60 TR so we are concatenating this 60 TR representation so it will be like 6 times 768 so that will be the representation. Yeah, and uh, we also did the uh, jet score normalization on both uh, stimulus features as well as the fMRI. And uh, when we apply jet score normalization, if we get any NANs, so we are converting the NANs to simple zeros. Yeah, so why we are deleting uh, all these uh, video feeds and uh, audio features because uh, um, this is not a pro version, this is a simple Go Google Colab version, so we don't have much memory to run the model. So we already have the, uh, the train stimulus features and uh, test stimulus features in the final, so that is why we deleted uh, the existing files. No, no, it's not memory error. I double click. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, this is, yeah, one is for the video and one is for the audio and one is for the text. Okay, yeah. Uh, so once if our uh, stimulus features are ready, that like uh, the TR level mapping uh, for a video as well as uh, text and audio, then we have a so since it's an encoding problem, so the input is a stimulus representation and uh, output is a fMRI response. And uh, here we are running a, a ridge regression model. And uh, alphas are like, uh, we, since it's a ridge regression model and uh, we don't want the model to be overfit, so we are running the regularization parameter. So it's uh, alpha 
and uh, we provided the the alpha values between the range from 10 power 1 to 10 power 3 so in between that particular range so since we are doing the cross validation so for the different alphas we will get a uh, different outputs and uh, wherever the best alpha we have there we get the better correlation Okay, so, the, so this is a bootstrapping uh, rigid regression. So here we are providing the X train. X train contains the stimulus representations. Y train contain uh, fMRI, and X test contain the uh, again stimulus representation, and Y test contain fMRI. And alphas and n boots like uh, how many number of cross validation runs? So, so how many times we want to run the cross validation? And we are also using the uh, chunk length uh, because uh, uh, since we want to test our alpha on the event test data, so we uh, since it's a TR level data, so if we use a uh, chunk, so it will divide the uh, TRs into different chunks, and uh, on the testing itself, we are testing our alpha values. And for evaluation, uh, we are using uh, two metrics. So one is a uh, 2v2 accuracy, and uh, as Maria already explained, how 2v2 works, and also the Pearson correlation. So these are the two metrics currently we are using for the evaluation. So we are calling a run regression function and we provided all the stimulus level and uh, fMRI. It will take bit time for the especially for the 2v2 case because uh, in case of 2v2 we have to do pairwise matching. Uh, let's say if you have n samples we have to do nc2 operations like if you take uh, every two samples and whether it's there is a match or not like that so it will take a bit time for the 2v2 accuracy Yes, it's, it's still running. Yeah, it's the same for audio and uh, text. Oh, session crashed. I think Joshua is following. Also, is it uh, yeah, session crashed due to RAM issue, I think. Okay, I think maybe I'll walk through it, I think. Yeah, so, yeah, once if the model runs, we will get a actual uh, predict, actual fMRI and we have the predicted fMRI. So we can, if we call the 2v2 function, so we will get the 2v2 accuracy and uh, similarly we'll get the Pearson correlation. It's the same for uh, audio and uh, textual data. And once if we have these uh, predictions, we also analyze the, the predictions at a uh, different oak cells. Suppose if we take a uh, oak cell 841, uh, for that 841 oak cell, uh, so this is like a, for oak cell, the TR, so across all the TRs, so the blue line indicates a uh, actual time series and uh, orange line indicates the predicted uh, time series for that particular oak cell 841. Similarly, we have the oak cell 65,000 and uh, oak cell number 80,000. Yeah, I think similarly we have uh, for the audio, the same for the textual data. Yeah, I think we have not added the uh, visualization part, especially the PyCortex thing, because uh, to do visualization using PyCortex, uh, we still need a ROI level mapping. 
um so yeah maybe we can uh, um provide that part later yeah I think it it's, it got crashed. I don't exactly. It's it's not loading after that for me. Hmm. Yeah, I think. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah. So let's uh, let you go to lunch. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you the schedule again that we plan to continue. Um. Yes. I don't quite know where the where it is, but we plan to continue at 1.30. With uh, Suba, we'll give the decoding part of the talk. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thanks for the patience. So hello everyone. So we can start our next session. So our next sessions will be uh, brain decoding and uh, advanced method summary and uh, future trends in this particular session. So we already covered uh, uh, stimulus representations and encoding part. So now we are starting the decoding part. So yeah. So right now we are at uh, deep learning for brain decoding. and this is the outline for the brain decoding uh, so in this particular brain decoding i am covering intro to brain decoding and uh, what is the difference between encoding and uh, decoding uh, stimulus uh, like uh, what is the input to the encoder model and uh, what is the input to the decoder model uh, well defined versus uh, like well posed problem versus ill posed problem so which one is a well well posed problem and which one is a ill posed problem and uh, decoding models we have again like uh, encoder models like uh, like in brain encoding we have uh, even in decoding also we have linear models and uh, non linear models uh, evaluating the brain decoding models uh, what kind of metrics we can use for the evaluation and uh, even i am also covering uh, linguistic brain decoding as well as the uh, visual brain decoding uh, what is brain decoding in brain decoding so can you read the mind with uh, fmri like uh, what a person is uh, thinking or what a person is uh, uh, listening or what a person is uh, watching some image so can we read a mind uh, uh, of a person with uh, fmri so the first part is uh, at least we can only get the brain activations like when a subject is uh, involved in certain activity so in brain decoding most of the a uh, decoding was they mainly focused on at least tell the, what the person saw like most of the decoding was mainly focused on at least what the person was uh, seeing or what, what the person was watching so the initial uh, decoding work suppose if i show a cat image uh, and we have a voxel activity and uh, for the dog we have a, a voxel pattern so there is a difference between the a uh, voxel pattern for the cat image as well as for the dog image now suppose if i show a show show uh, shoe image then i am having a different voxel pattern now then if i use a, a decoder model where i give the voxel pattern as an input to the model and i'll try to predict the shoe so this is like a decoding problem where the input is a, a fmri and output is i'm just predicting what category it is like what the subject is watching so whether it's a cat dog or shoe in case of a uh, linguistic task now the subject is watching a uh, word with a image like a dog image and as well as the dog word and we have a fmri image now if we give that fmri voxel act activity as an input to the model and we try to predict the category so it's a dog so we are just predicting the category here so this is a linguistic task so there are some uh, popular uh, decoding works in the literature 
So I am showing uh, how they have constructed the uh, movie reconstruction or image reconstruction or like a, uh, audio reconstruction from the fMRI data. Oh, so, so here uh, internet works here. So it's not playing. Uh, is the video is not working? There is no video in the presentation here. No, it's a, just a YouTube link. Uh, we don't have any way of doing a YouTube link, sorry. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so these are all the uh, actually uh, YouTube links. Uh, so, yeah. So, there is a problem with the internet here, maybe. So yeah, maybe I will walk through what they did. So suppose if we can look at this particular uh, image here. So they have shown the tiger image and uh, when they have shown the tiger image, we have an fMRI activity and uh, with the fMRI activity and they try to reconstruct the what the sub, uh, subject was watching. Yeah, so it's, it's not clear what uh, the subject was watching, but at least they got some shape like it's li uh, related to tiger. This is the... Uh, image reconstruction similarly uh, from the gallant lab so this work was came in uh, 2011 where, where uh, it's a movie reconstruction where subject was uh, presented as short clips uh, youtube short clips and uh, they recorded fmri and with the fmri activity and they try to reconstruct the movie back similarly auditory decoding in auditory decoding where subject is listening listening some music and uh, we have an fMRI activity and the same fMRI activity is given as an input to the model and they try to reconstruct the music back. Yeah, so if you download these slides and maybe if you can uh, open in your system so you can see all these uh, YouTube links. For the linguistic decoding, now uh, input is a fMRI and uh, we try to predict the its category like what category it's whether it's a related to cat or whether it's related to dog so what is uh, difference between encoding and uh, decoding in encoding uh, we present the stimulus as an input uh, like if we show the uh, stimulus to a subject and we have a is measured brain activity now, if we present the stimulus representation as an input to the encoder model, and we will get the fMRI as an output, and in the decoding, we will give the fMRI as an input to the model, and we will try to reconstruct the stimulus back. What is brain encoding? So, in brain encoding, we present the stimulus to a, a language model, and where we will get the internal representations of the stimulus, and the same stimulus was shown to subject, and we have our internal representations like fMRI, and uh, the Model is simple rigid regression model where the input is a uh, stimulus representation and the output is fMRI. And we use the correlation measure to evaluate the model performance. If you can look at the encoder and uh, decoder models in uh, artificial intelligence, suppose if we take a convolution neural network, in CNNs we have an encoder where if we give the image as an input to the CNN model and we will get the latent representation of image and the, if we pass the latent representation to the decoder model and uh, if it is an auto encoder model we try to reconstruct the image back, uh, if it uh, like either, either we can do convolution or deconvolution, we know what exactly we expect from the decoder model. So in the CNNs we expect the output is a reconstructed image in case of uh, uh, like uh, language, we expect the output will be, suppose if you are doing a machine translation task, you expect uh, what the target language it is. So, uh, suppose if you are doing a, a, a sentence reconstruction, then you can expect the same sentence reconstruction at the decoder. So we know what we expect, uh, what is the exactly uh, the output we get at the decoder in the artificial intelligence. 
well posed versus ill posed problems in um, neuroscience. So if we give an, a, a visual image and if we have a fMRI brain activity pattern, we can do the brain ac uh, encoding problem. So in encoding, we know that which brain areas will get activated if we show a particular stimulus. So it's a well-defined problem. Your target is always which brain areas are activating uh, when you involved in certain tasks. Suppose if you are involved in a language task, you can expect that the activations mostly comes from the language areas. Suppose if you are involved in a visual task, you can expect that the activations comes from the visual cortex. Or suppose if you are involved in a, uh, like you are listening something, you can expect that there is an activation especially from the auditory area. So encoding is uh, nothing but how the stimulus is represented in the brain. Decoding can we reconstruct the stimulus given the brain response. So this is what the current decoding models mostly focused on. But still brain decoding is a ill-defined problem. Um, so when I show something uh, like uh, when you are watching movie, you are just watching only movie or you are relating to many other things in the world. You can relate to your past memories. So it's not related to one task, only the subject is fo focusing. Like when we are uh, reading something or when you are watching movie or when you are watching image, you relate many things in the real world. So decoding, uh, current decoding works always focus on just reconstructing the stimulus back. But in the brain, not only one particular area get activated, even other areas also involved when you are involved in certain tasks. So, but uh, all these uh, decoding works, they just, uh, suppose if you are doing the image reconstruction, they take the voxels of visual cortex and they try to reconstruct the image. Suppose uh, they want to reconstruct the st sentence, they just take the language area voxels and they try to reconstruct the stimulus. So this is a, a ill-defined problem yet in the brain decoding. So what information to be decoded exactly? Suppose if you are uh, watching or listening, what exactly we have to decode? So we don't know, right, like uh, what exactly we want from a person. So at this particular moment, so subject is involved in certain task and I want to decode. That means what the person is thinking at that particular moment. So this is what we want to decode from a, a subject. But right now we are just decoding the stimulus only. So can we read the, can we read what the subject is thinking while watching the stimulus? So we want to read a, a person mind when a person is involved in certain task. So that is why decoding is a, uh, in, an ill posed problem. So there are, yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure I thought why encoding is not an ill posed problem. Uh, because uh, in encoding, uh, it is well defined, like if you take a certain task, suppose if you are working on a linguistic task, so you have a clear cut idea that, okay, so you want to do, you want to predict fMRI. So when you predict fMRI, uh, your main focus is like uh, which, which, uh, which area of voxels got activated and you are, suppose if it is a linguistic task, definitely you can expect that the linguistic area voxels get activated and you can also uh, interpret that, okay, so even if you go to the sub-regions of the language, like inferior frontal gyrus or middle frontal gyrus, even you can look at all the sub-regions, what is happening in the, uh, like a language task, similarly for the vision task. But for the decoding, why I want to reconstruct the only the stimulus, so that the only person is thinking about the image, Um, at least, uh, like yeah, in encoding, they try to predict even whole brain also, not only the la language region, even they try to predict the whole brain cells, and even you can look at the other brain areas as well, how the model is predicting. But in the decoding, uh, which cells we have to take, especially for a reconstruction. Yeah, so there are, uh, again, like uh, encoding, we have uh, two types of decoder models. So one is a linear model and one is a non-linear model. In linear decoder models, suppose if you have an image and if you give that uh, image, we have an fMRI activity and uh, if we give that fMRI activity to a simple regression or like a logistic regression model, suppose if you want to do a, a classification task or if you want to do the stimulus representation back, in that case, you have to use a simple uh, ridge regression or linear regression. 
so here it's a logistic regression model because uh, here you want to predict the category so if you use ridge uh, you have to get the stimulus representation back it's a, just a continuous vector if you use a logistic regression then you will get the classification like what kind of different categories are present for the nonlinear decoder models like uh, yeah if you give a whole brain volume as an input to the uh, any cnn model and uh, we can expect directly the prediction like if you give a whole brain image because it's a 3d volume fmri is so if you give the 3d volume as an input to the any cnn model and we can get the category of that particular volume so whether it's related to cat or dog or something yeah so like a deep cnns so how we can evaluate uh, uh, decoding models so one of the uh, standard metric in uh, decoder models uh, pairwise accuracy like uh, in uh, encoders we have 2v2 accuracy the uh, 2v2 and pairwise are almost similar so the only difference is like in 2v2 accuracy uh, they use cosine distance whereas in uh, pair, uh, pairwise accuracy we use a cor co correlation suppose if we take an example uh, suppose a sentence an apartment is uh, self there is some stimulus and uh, for that particular stimulus we have a uh, concept word is uh, apartment and we have its uh, yeah and uh, we have another stimulus uh, like uh, it's a building so building is a one concept and apartment is another concept and uh, it's a jth concept word and why is uh, it's a textual semantic representation it's like a representation of uh, apartments similarly why i had is like a predicted representation like uh, if you give an fmri we will get the predicted representation right so the why i had is the predicted representation similarly yj is the actual semantic representation of uh, building and yj hat will be its a predicted representation now if you have yi yi -Y hat and yj yj hat now how we can compute pairwise accuracy um, what we have to do is uh, we have to find the correlation between yi yi -Y hat and yj yj hat if the correlation like if the sum of correlation is high uh, compared to correlation of yi yi yj hat and uh, yj and yi -Y hat so if the correlation is high then it is a match otherwise uh, no match so here we can use the accuracy so there is another uh, decoding metric uh, which is a rank accuracy so how we can measure the rank accuracy so if you take a concept word uh, apartment and it's a semantic representation or like a linguistic representation and uh, what are all the n number of examples because when we have when we train a any model we at least we have n number of examples for all the n linguistic examples we have its uh, a semantic representations uh, y1 to yn like that means you have n number of examples in the data set now what we have to do is we have to find the correlation of uh, yi hat with all the n number of examples so once if you get the correlation then wherever the index is matching because uh, in the n examples definitely one of the example will be related to yi so the wherever the index is matching i equal to j so that is the matched correlation and uh, that will be the index so now how we will uh, like if you want to get the rank of that particular uh, concept so what we have to do is we have to do all the if you sort the correlations in a, a like a descending order so we will get the index so where the exactly the index is then the to compute the rank accuracy it will be 1 minus rank of like 1 minus rank minus 1 by n minus 1 so rank is nothing but so where exactly it's matching and n will be the number of examples so this is how we can compute the rank accuracy um, so the uh, other um, metric is a representation similarity matrix so representation similarity matrix comes for both encoding and decoding and it's not for evaluating the encoder or decoder models so this is a one way to compare the representations of brain as well as the representations of a uh, linguistic stimulus or visual stimulus so in case of representation similarity let's say you have n scenes for every scene we have brain activity so for the first scene we have a brain activity for the second scene we have a brain activity and let, let's say you have n number of scenes then you have n brain activations then if you want to compute representation similarity then take uh, scene one uh, brain activation and uh, 
compute the correlation with the all the remaining scenes brain activation so it's, it's like a uh, so like scene one brain activation representation and we are finding the correlation with the remaining all other uh, brain activation representation so that is how we can compute the uh, like a representation similarity matrix so here uh, correlation of uh, scene 1 and uh, scene 2 let's say for example like if you have n scenes you will get n by n matrix this is in the uh, context of uh, brain activity representations uh, so we have another matrix representation dissimilarity matrix so representation dissimilarity matrix it's like a 1 minus correlation so in case of si similarity we will do the correlation if you want a uh, dissimilarity we have to do 1 minus correlation so one is at the image level suppose if you have n number of images for every image we have a representation and uh, if you do correlation at the representation level like a linguistic representation you get a one rsm matrix for the uh, like a stimulus and a one rsm matrix for the brain images yeah so suppose if you have a language model and uh, for n scenes you get a n by n matrix and similarly for the brain activity also we have n brain activations and again we, we get uh, another n by n matrix in the context of brain. Now if you want to compare whether the representational space of uh, images and representation space of brain we can do the representation similarity analysis. So here we can use the cosine distance or uh, again correlation. Yeah so here uh, DSM is nothing but uh, RDM so it's a representational dissimilarity matrix. Yeah, uh, yeah. So there are other uh, evaluating metrics like uh, yeah. So we have Pearson correlation. If you have a uh, one voxel, uh, like yeah, it's in the co context of uh, representational space. So suppose for a uh, one sentence, we have its uh, feature dimension like 768 in case of BERT, and uh, with the predicted model also we get 768 dimension. And if you want to get the correlation like this. And yeah, some people also used mean squared error uh, between actual stimulus representation and uh, projected stimulus representation. Yeah. So any questions uh, till now? Yeah. If you don't have any questions, then you can. Yeah. 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 That might be decodable from, from the neurons, but that doesn't necessarily mean the brain is using that at all in its, in its computation. Uh, yeah, so yeah right now what people are doing is uh, that is why so they just focus on certain area like uh, if you are performing a visual task so they only f uh, focus on the visual area work cells and uh, they try to reconstruct the stimulus so that is what exactly they are doing but they are not interpreting what exactly brain is uh, doing so when you are performing certain task so it's, it's a difficult problem what a person is thinking at that particular moment and decoding uh, even uh, there are ethical concerns also involved here. Yeah. yeah. So here, uh, yeah, I'm going to focus on now uh, language-related brain decoding papers. And may, uh, so these are the popular works. Uh, Parira. So this is the uh, like I can say after Parira, there are many works. Uh, there are f th these many works focused on the Parira-related works. Uh, so Parira decoding work is a, a very good work uh, he did at the word level after that we have sentence and uh, even uh, transformer based model scheme. Then Wang et al. Uh, Wang et al is also re, uh, it's, it's related to Parira work but it's uh, more of sentence level. Gautier and uh, Affolter, uh, Abdu and uh, yeah my work. So I'm going to uh, focus on the first work uh, toward word level linguistic brain decoding or uh, universal brain decoder. So in the classical decoding works, what exactly they used to do is like, uh, um, so decoding solution, extracting linguistic meaning from imaging data, like, uh, so this is a Mitchell uh, data set, 60 concrete nouns. 
so the concrete nouns means we can imagine easy like apartment uh, dog bell uh, these are the concrete nouns so for every noun we have an fmri image and if we give that fmri image as input to the model we just uh, decode the category like uh, so uh, the 60 concrete nouns are divided into 12 categories animals uh, belongs to one category uh, like um, uh, so, um, like um, vegetables belongs to another category so under vegetables itself we have tomato potato all these words they, uh, in the 60 concrete nouns so they, their main focus is like uh, just decoding the 12 categories not the 60 concrete nouns just uh, decoding the 12 categories Yeah, so same data, so like uh, the 60 concrete nouns only divided for training and testing and a small number of semantic categories just with the uh, 12 categories, so in the uh, earlier uh, classical decoding works. And these are some of examples like uh, uh, animals, so these are all the 12 categories um, like beer, uh, arm, apartment, these are all the uh, different words. Now uh, in the in the Parira work, um, so they represented, so they developed a new approach uh, for a brain decoding system. So what exactly they did? So rather than just focusing on the concrete nouns, uh, they focused both the concrete and uh, abstract nouns. Like uh, so, abstract noun means suppose uh, if I say success, success is a word. Uh, so it's one of the word in that particular data set. In the Parira data set, success is a word also one of the, uh, it's, it's related to abstract word. And uh, what exactly they did is, uh, so uh, out of 180 words, they have around uh, 100 words belongs to concrete nouns, around 60 words belongs to abstract words, and there are some verbs, and there is a function word and uh, they use uh, a glove model to represent the representations because in earlier classical decoding works uh, as uh, Maria also suggested in the encoding, um, they just use a manual uh, feature representation like they give word in uh, Amazon mechanical talk and ask people to uh, what are the similar words related to this particular word. So that is how they obtain the features. Now in, in, this, in this particular work, uh, at, at least they use a, a pre-trained word embeddings to get the representations for every word. So coming to the uh, data set, uh, there are, so in the experiment one, suppose if we take a concept bird, for the same concept word bird, we have three views. So one is the same concept appeared in a sentence view, like now the word bird appeared in sentences. And uh, for all the 180 concepts, now they have the fMRI activity. Similarly, uh, now the same word is presented in the form of image. Now for all the 180 images, again we have a fMRI brain activity. Now the third view is word cloud view. In word cloud view, a concept word is surrounded by its semantically related words. And uh, again for the, in the word cloud also, we have a, a corresponding brain activity. So it's like a multi view, like one concept you can view in a, like in the different forms, like one you can uh, view in the sentence form where you have the context representation. Second one in the form of image, you can only imagine what you are seeing. Third one is a word surrounded by its semantical related words. You can relate a concept with all its related words. Uh, so for the uh, experiment one, uh, total yeah, 128 uh, nouns, 22 verbs, 29 adjectives, one functional word and uh, 16 subjects they have uh, captured and uh, the atlas is like they have mapped to two atlases, one is like AIL atlas with 180 regions and Gordon atlas with uh, 330 regions. Coming to the second experiment, experiment two and three are mostly related to its a passage reading. Uh, so here also uh, in experiment two, it's related to a topic musical instrument and uh, again in the musical instrument itself three different subtopics like a clarinet, accordion, so these are all related to musical instrument but the main topic is musical instrument and all the passages are related like that. Okay, so the main topic is musical instrument but its uh, subtopics are like a clarion, accordion like that. In experiment three, uh, if you see the topic is gambling and the, every passage is related to gambling only. So there is no subtopic involved in the experiment three. 
yeah so so when we recorded fmri we it will we will get in the form of 3d volume and uh, giving the 3d volume like uh, all the uh, voxels let's say uh, in the parira data set the number of voxels uh, are like uh, almost more than 200000 and giving 200000 voxels to uh, a regression model and predicting the stimulus representations like we have a dimensionality reduction problem so to avoid that uh, we have to focus on the uh, informative voxels so how they captured the informative voxels so now we present the stimulus to a subject and we have a his brain image like it's a 3d volume so what they did now for the same stimulus we have its a, a stimulus representation now what they did for every voxel for every individual voxels we also have the its a neighboring voxels like a 26 neighbor voxels for every voxel means a total 27 voxels as a input to a model ridge regression model and they try to predict the stimulus representation so they did it for all the 200000 voxels like a, every voxel with all the its a neighboring voxels they repeated for all the 200000 voxels and they computed the pearson correlation for every voxel across feature dimensions then uh, now for every voxel we got the uh, pearson correlation now what we have to do is we have to select the voxels where we got the top 5000 correlation so these are the informative voxels they consider for the model building yeah so the experimental setup they followed uh, 18 fold cross validation and in every fold they did the informative voxel selection so for every fold the informative voxel selection is different and the model is a ridge regression model now for the concept picture model how the brain decoding schematic works like if you present the stimulus to a subject we have fmri and uh, the reduced image is nothing but the informative voxels and the same stimulus was shown, given to uh, glove model and it's we have its a uh, a linguistic representation and we build a, a simple ridge regression model and uh, we will get the yeah we use a, a evaluation matrix like pairwise accuracy or rank accuracy similarly yeah so this is a, another view like uh, the same concept picture in in case of concept sentence now uh, it's the same Uh, the schematic is same now rather than giving the uh, picture as an input to the model now we are getting the fmri response in the concept sentence view but rest of the things are same uh, so the only the, the informative voxels are coming from the concept sentence view rather than the concept picture view and here uh, the stimulus representation again it's only concept representation it's not the sentence representation so they are only taking the apartment representation at the input not the whole sentence representation at the input okay yeah so for the experiment 2 and 3 uh, so they they subdiv again they divided into three models so one model is at a different topics so what do you mean by different topic so in training we use one topic data but in testing we use completely different topic data let's say Uh, if i use apartment related uh, uh, sentences in the training then in the testing uh, so the sentences are completely related to butterfly the model have never seen the sentences is related to butterfly in the training at all so the topics are completely different in the in this particular schematic yeah if you see here uh, apartment related sentences only in the training but uh, in the testing it's related to butterfly so the topic is completely different here so it's like it's a, that is why it's a different topics now the second experiment different passages from the same topic now here uh, the topic is insect and in insect itself we have different categories so one category is related to butterfly one category is related to dragonfly now in training we we will only use uh, sentences related to dragonfly but in testing we use uh, sentences from the butterfly so this is like a uh, different passages but the topic is same yeah so the third experiment uh, different sentences within the same passage now uh, so it's all related uh, the sentences uh, from the same topic like if we take a piano so all the sentences are coming from the same passage itself both in training and uh, testing 
yeah even for the testing also we use the sentence from the same passage so here the all the is related to concept piano yeah. now if you can look at the uh, results pair wise uh, and rank wise results uh, here we have a uh, each view like a pair wise uh, picture view sentence view and word cloud view and the final one is the average of all the three views and uh, we can see that uh, the we are getting the better decoding accurate see especially from the picture view and uh, followed by uh, sentence view and these are all the 16 subjects and whatever all the the dots are representing which are uh, representing the subjects and uh, similarly for experiment 2 and 3 we have different topics uh, same topic different passage and uh, same top, like same passage sentence from same passage yeah and we also have the uh, rank accuracy for all the subjects yeah so now the focus is we selected the informative work cells from the brain image but how these informative work cells are distributed in the brain at least we can do that sort of analysis in the brain decoding because we are using some uh, linguistic representations from a language model and we are selecting the informative work cells are these informative work cells are meaningful or not are these work cells are coming from the right areas or not now if you can look at the uh, distribution of informative work cells like from all the 5000 work cells um so uh, they they mainly focused on four networks so one is language network default mode network uh, visual network and uh, task path to network if you can see the most of the work cells are coming from the language visual and followed by uh, task and uh, dmn and we yeah, we have uh, other uh, other uh, area work cells as well but at least like out of 5000 work cells we can see like more than 70 to 80% of the work cells are mainly coming from these networks so the, so we we have a clear cut uh, um, analysis or insights that we didn't provide any information to the model that take these work cells from these areas uh, everything we did like we just took the representations from the language model and we try to get the informative work cells but all these work cells are coming from the proper brain regions like language region uh, visual region uh, dmn network and task path to network and yeah so these work cells even the 5000 informative work cells they even they uh, projected on the brain surface and uh, yeah so it's clearly visible that uh, the temporal and the language areas are active here. and uh, yeah so the uh, so they also tried with not only 5000 work cells even they consider the uh, more than 50000 work cells like yeah uh, so for the 5000 work cells we have the experiment 2 and 3 we have the uh, pair wise accuracy um, and also uh, rather than just taking the uh, 5000 work cells from the whole brain so they only focused on the work cells of language region and they try to measure the uh, pair wise accuracy similarly uh, from the task positive network we have around uh, 11000 work cells similarly for visual we have 8000 work cells only the work cells of particular area and they try to predict the uh, pair wise accuracy and uh, um, like rank wise accuracy yeah so 50000 informative work cells suppose if we take 50000 informative work cells still the decoding performance is almost similar to the 5000 informative work cells yeah so what the insights mean mainly from this uh, parira work like uh, yeah so they presented a viable approach for building a universal decoder model uh, capable of extracting uh, meaningful representations uh, from the uh, linguistic materials yeah so this is the main uh, insights from this particular work and also uh, the text semantic resolution um, uh, resolution of uh, brain based decoding of mental content will be rapidly yeah yeah and uh, we also have seen the the distribution of informative work cells and uh, yeah so the work cells are coming from the proper uh, brain regions yeah any questions uh, yeah yeah thank you yeah yes yes yeah i think um, in the upcoming slides uh, we have more cognitive insights because 
the basic work uh, it's mainly focused on the whether these representations are matching as, at least associated with the brain or not so the, that is what parira work shown but the upcoming works uh, i think in the next upcoming slides i'll show even uh, more cognitive insights uh, in the brain perspective as well Uh, for the decoding? Yeah, so if, if I do decoding, okay. So one aspect is like a brain computer interface, like uh, uh, so uh, depression, like uh, so whether if I take a person's brain activity when a person is reading. And uh, if I try to decode uh, his uh, brain, um, whether I'm getting the, uh, like, so the main idea is at least uh, we can get the representation back or not. So if the correlation is not matching at all, so maybe the person is uh, not interpreting the uh, paragraph very well, like other persons, because here we can do decoder model individual subject wise, and for every subject we have the decoding accuracy. And for some subjects, we are getting a high accuracy of 80% or like 90%. And for some of the subjects, we have seen only 50% or 55%. So it's a problem with the person because other persons, we are getting the high decoding accuracy. Why not for the other people? So there is some problem in uh, interpreting or maybe he is uh, not good at some skills. Yeah, so toward uh, sentence level brain decoding. So this work is uh, mostly, it's almost similar to the Parira work, but rather than using the word level representations, now we are going to use uh, sentence level representations. So the remaining, the schematic is almost same, the brain decoding schematic, like uh, the informative voxel selection and uh, the uh, building the rigid regression model, everything is same. And in this particular work, uh, they have used nine uh, distributed sentence representations and uh, all these uh, distributed sentence representations are sentence based uh, models. Like if you give a sentence to a model, we'll get a sentence representation directly, not the average of uh, word representations using a glove model. Yeah, so the, they followed uh, nine distributed sentence representation models and uh, these sentence representations models are uh, unstructured and uh, structured based models. And they have used two types of decoders. One is a similarity based decoder and uh, second category of decoding is like a regression based decoding. Yeah, so out of this uh, nine distributed sentence representations, uh, some are like unstructured, under unstructured we have average pooling. Uh, I think in the morning session, Manish Gupta is already covered like uh, uh, what are the different uh, pooling methods like average pooling, max pooling, or a concatenation of max pooling and uh, average pooling. These are all come under unstructured uh, representations. Whereas in, in structured, we have uh, skip thought vectors, fair sequence or infercent, or even we have BERT, uh, like GPT-2, uh, excellent, these are all the uh, structured based representations. Yeah, so in this particular work, uh, they have used nine uh, distributed sentence representations and uh, uh, so these people only, they have extended their work by adding the uh, these bird representations. And the data is like, uh, yeah, experiment two and three data because experiment one is mainly related to concepts, whereas experiment two and three are related to sentences. Five, uh, five subjects uh, were reading uh, 627 sentences and uh, they captured the fMRI. Again, the same so subtopics, uh, different topic and uh, same topic, different passage or sentences coming from the same passage. Yeah, so the first type of decoder, they have used uh, similarity based decoder. And in case of similarity based decoder, they are not building any model here. It's completely based on the uh, correlations or like a, a representation similarity matrix. So how they did, uh, let's say, uh, like suppose if you have eight samples, for all the eight samples, we have a, it's a sentence representation. Similarly, for all the eight samples, we have a brain activation. Now what they did, uh, they constructed a matrix uh, at the sentence level representations. We will get an eight by eight matrix. Similarly, um, at the uh, for the brain activations also we'll get eight by eight matrix, eight samples. Then 
suppose if, uh, if I take, uh, if I choose 3 and 6th uh, sample, for the 3rd and 6th uh, sample, these are the representations for uh, sample 3 and sample 6 coming from the neural similarity matrix. Similarly, if I pick 3 and 6 from the stimulus vector. Now we got the uh, representations both in the neural uh, similarity matrix as well as the uh, from the sentence similarity matrix. Since we already picked the 3 and 6, we have to remove the uh, 3 and 6 cells from the uh, particular vectors. So now suppose if we drop these two uh, cells, yeah, remove th 3 and uh, 6 cells. Now this is the representation of 3 and uh, this is like a reduced vector. So once if we have these reduced vectors, now if I take an unknown vector, like I don't know what exactly the label for the uh, uh, another un unknown vectors. So if, if I take a neural vectors and I don't know what the labels are, then what I have to do is like a simple uh, uh, correlation, like a correlation of A3 and the correlation of B6, if it is greater than the correlation of, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a cross, same what I have discussed about the pairwise accuracy, it's the same kind of uh, similarity metric. If it is greater correlation, it is a match, otherwise uh, no match. So that is how we can assign the labels here. So there is no model building here, it's completely based on the uh, representation matrix. And yeah, so these are the results for the similarity based decoding across all the, uh, the three different uh, uh, types and uh, across all the five subjects. So the next category, uh, like a regression based uh, decoding, uh, for the regression based decoding, they tried uh, uh, three different models. Uh, so here, region and LASO are the linear based models and uh, MLP is like a, a non-linear model. And uh, among all these models, uh, we can see that Infercent is consistently performing uh, for all the uh, three subtopics across like a ridge regression, LASO and uh, MLP. Similarly, for the rank accuracy also we can see Infercent is uh, performing way better than the other distributed sentence representations. Now they also tried a, a distribution of informative work cells for all these nine distributed sentence representations. And uh, we can see again the, the four networks, language, visual, DMN and uh, task positive network, we can see that uh, the distribution of informative work cells are consistent across all the uh, uh, nine models. And if you only focus on the uh, language atlas and uh, visual atlas, uh, like the only voxels are coming from the language atlas and if you try to predict the decoding accuracy, uh, like if you predict the stimulus representation and measure the decoding accuracy. Similarly, from the visual atlas, if you take the voxels and if we do the decoding and uh, for each subject wise, we have the decoding accuracy here. And one can observe that since it's uh, related to completely sentence representations, uh, we can clearly see that language atlas uh, model like where we have a better decoding accuracy compared to the visual atlas uh, task. So the main insights are like uh, the supervised structure models are better performing than the uh, unstructured models like uh, uh, the infercent model is a uh, like a structured model and uh, it's a supervised structured model and it's performing better compared to the unstructured models like uh, average pooling or uh, max pooling models. Yeah, Infercent, uh, it's a specifically it's consistent across all the models and without any prior a priori location constraints, we didn't provide any uh, inf con constraint to the model that pick oak, oak cells from the only these areas. Uh, without any a priori knowledge, still uh, our model selected the oak cells and which are uh, related to the language atlas. So the conclusion is that brain regions active in language processing are also highly corresponding to these representations. So this is the one of the main insight uh, got from this particular work. So the third work is like uh, linking artificial and uh, human neural representation of language. Now we have seen that, uh, so now we have a clear cut uh, insights that st stimulus representations are well associated with the language uh, brain recordings. 
and uh, even the earlier works like uh, Vibe work or like uh, Martin Schimpf works, they have shown that these stimulus representations are uh, accurately predict the brain activity and in Leela Vibe work, uh, even uh, the performance, the decoding performance is greater than the, like, uh, the chance performance. Now, the question is, why these mappings are successful? Why these sentence representations are successful uh, in the decoding or encoding? So in order to do that, uh, in this particular work, rather than just focusing on the pre-trained representations, so here they have focused on the task level representations. Suppose if you have an fMRI and if you present the, uh, like if you have a uh, one bird, the bird flu, so this is a stimulus and we have a fMRI brain activity and the same stimulus was given to a language model and we have its representation. Now in this particular work, the, rather than just taking the representations from the pre-trained language model, uh, they consider from the fine-tuned language models like uh, question answering, sentiment analysis, uh, so because the theory is already proven that rep linguistic representations are well associated with the brain, now we will go one more deeper level that which tasks are highly associated with the brain, whether the sentiment analysis is highly associated or paraphrase is highly associated, so, so we are doing one more deeper level here. So this is a task specific output, um, so eva yeah, evaluate the link between human brain activity and the neural representations models are optimized for the different uh, NLP tasks. So pre-trained model, we have pre-trained BERT and uh, different fine-tuned models like uh, NLI, uh, question answering, sentiment analysis and uh, in this particular work they mainly focused on four NLP tasks like paraphrase, question answering, sentiment analysis and uh, natural language inference. So for every task they fine tune the BERT model and the representations they consider from the fine tuned model. And they also not only considering the just fine tuned and pre-trained models, they also have chosen some custom tasks like a scrambled language modeling. In scrambled language modeling, so we shuffle the words within a sentence so suppose uh, the blue uh, box is indicating the original sentence and uh, in the scrambled model we shuffle the words in the particular sentence. Uh, similarly, uh, scrambled para, in case of scrambled para, uh, now we have a paragraph, now words are shuffled in the paragraph. Suppose this is a paragraph and the words are shuffled in the paragraph. So now uh, the model fine-tuned on the uh, this uh, scrambled data, uh, like a language uh, scrambled uh, words and the scrambled paragraphs, the BERT model fine-tuned. And also part of speech mo uh, language modeling, where uh, rather than predicting the masked word, here we predict the uh, POS tag token. So the, the masked token is a POS tag token here. Yeah, so one is a, a corrected dependency parser and uh, the dotted line represent the uh, incorrect dependency parser because uh, if we shuffled uh, the words and uh, if you want to get the PO stack, so definitely we'll get incorrect dependencies. Yeah, so the masked word is a PO stack rather than just a next word prediction or like a just a uh, masked word prediction. And the data set they have used, again the Parira data set, experiment two and three, so the same data set. And if you can look at the brain decoding performance, uh, if you can see that a scrambled language model is performing way better than the either pre-trained or uh, fine-tuned language model. Um, so this is a, a surprising thing because uh, uh, the earlier work have shown that uh, either pre-trained or fine-tuned models are working better and here uh, like uh, the scrambled model is performing way better than the uh, either pre-trained or fine-tuned language models. Yeah, scrambled language model sh shown better performance here. And if you can also look at the, the trajectory over fine tuning, like uh, fine tuning step, like uh, if we can uh, increase, keep on increasing the fine tuning steps, like whether we want to run for two epochs or up to 30 epochs. Uh, here also we can see that the scrambled language models are performing way better than the uh, pre-trained or fine tuned language models. And they also construct the representation similarity matrix, like uh, we have the uh, representation from the every model and uh, they try to compute the representation similarity matrix. And uh, yeah, so you can see that scrambled model is having the higher Pearson correlation compared to the other models. 
So in summary, uh, so from this particular work, scramble language models are better at uh, higher decoding performance compared to the pre-trained or uh, fine-tuned language models. Yeah, so this is a bit surprising. Uh, models optimized uh, for a language scrambled and a language scrambled uh, paragraphs, the model which shown a better decoding performance. Uh, here, uh, they have shown uh, the subjects are reading sentences here. Um, we are at to test for the listening because at least for the reading when we read a sentence and if I ask can you rephrase it what you read at least we can provide the sentences in a scrambled order because we never repeat the sentence in the same way uh, because if we are uh, telling to someone that this is how I read this sentence in your paraphrase manner. Whereas in case of listening when you are listening something and uh, you, are, you are not viewing any word and you don't know the grammar. Um, so we are still yet to check whether the scramble language models uh, better decoding or like a pre-trained or fine-tuned language models. Yeah, up to here any questions? Yeah, yeah. What are the main? Yeah, the, uh, that, uh, that, that they have not tested yet, like uh, so here uh, they have only considered the representation from the language model. Maybe they have performed uh, this kind of task like uh, um, so for the same sentence if we have a fMRI activity and if we scrambled the words and if we give the same again the scrambled sentences to a person and if we take the fMRI activity maybe we have to measure uh, whether the brain is representing the correct sentence or the scrambled sentence well. Yeah. 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 So the intuition behind is uh, as well uh, because if we take a transformer language model, it's a complete self-attention mechanism. So it doesn't follow any order. Like if I take one word, how the words are related with the all other words present in the sentence? It's a, a bidirectional context. So the word order is uh, included only in the form of positional embeddings in the transformer model, but it's completely like a self-attention based uh, model for the BERT model. So that is why they tested, suppose if we shuffled the uh, sentences and if we again fine tune the model, so whether these fine tuned representations works well or compared to uh, taking the direct representation from the correct uh, paragraphs or something. Yeah, but these results are a bit surprising, uh, like the scrambled language models are giving better decoding performance than the uh, pre-trained or fine-tuned uh, language models. Just make sure I'm understanding, the, the uh, neural recordings are yeah. non-scrambled. Yeah. Yeah. All these brain recordings are from coming from the uh, only uh, correct sentences, no, not from the scrambled data. Yeah. Yeah, just to random, random scrambling. Oh no, uh, I just for the example I have shown, like they have the bunch of paragraphs and uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, any questions in Zoom? Yeah. So if, if a scrambled uh, input leads to better decodability, would, uh, would that constitute like a lexical effect? That is perhaps not considering word order effects and rather just presence of lexical items? Um, yes, uh, so one thing might be like in the BERT, uh, it's a hierarchical uh, language model and uh, if a word, just if we change the position of the word, automatically the representation of uh, word changes in BERT model. Yeah. So yeah, might be the lexical information also one of the fact. Yeah, so yeah, till now we have seen uh, only the representations. Now uh, the next work is like, now can we reconstruct the stimulus back because till now we are only talking about the, the continuous vector representation. Now can we get the, the stimulus itself like directly the words. So brain to word decoding brain activity for a language generation. I think uh, this is the one of the work uh, they have used uh, 
non-linear based decoder model where uh, we have a fMRI brain activity. Um, so here are 65,000 oxels brain image and they build a, a autoencoder model where they try to reconstruct the brain image back. So this is the first thing they have did. Suppose uh, 65,000 oxels. So this is a brain image and if we give to a CNN model and we will get the latent representation and that latent representation will be like a 2000 two dimensional representation. And if we give the same representation back to a deconvolution and we try to get the representation back. So this is the first task they perform like a, it's an autoencoder model and uh, so they use MSE loss to optimize the uh, representation uh, reconstruction. Then once if we have the latent representation learned from the brain images, we will take the representation of the latent representation and uh, on top of it, either you can build a simple MLP model or you can use a simple ridge regression model to get the uh, directly classifying words or you can get the stimulus representation back. So this is a, a non-linear way of decoding because here uh, it's a, uh, they are not taking the representations from a language model and they use some ridge regression to get the uh, FM uh, like stimulus representation rather than here uh, so they build an end to end uh, autoencoder based model where we will get the representation for the brain image and uh, on top of it we have a, a either regression or a classification. Yeah, so they try to compare with the all the works like a uh, Parira work or like a uh, toward uh, sentence level decoder. Yeah, so sample MLP, sample MLP means like uh, on top of the uh, latent representation, they created an another MLP layer and uh, they try to get the uh, representation. And uh, big MLP means uh, uh, just a, not a single layer, they added more non-linear layers to get the representation. And they also perform the classification decoding accuracy. So if you can use a softmax layer on top of the uh, final layer, we will get the categories like because if we have 180 categories, uh, so they also perform the classification decoding. Yeah, so among all these uh, co compared to all the previous models, so their method is performing uh, way better than the all other previous work. Yeah, so conditional language generation. Uh, so here they are uh, even generating the uh, stimulus. So how they did it? So suppose if you have an fMRI, so in the step one, so if you have an fMRI, if you give to their model, we will get a representation. And uh, if you have a classification decoder, we will get uh, 180 words. And since it's a softmax layer, uh, for all the 180 words, we will get a 180 probabilities. And if you take only the top five predictions, we will get a top five words. For all the type top five words, we will apply a glove model, like we are extracting the glove representations for all the type top five words. Then in the third step, so they are considering the, uh, because for the GPT-2 model, initially you have to provide some context, like if you provide a word, then only GP 2 will generate uh, words based on the previous words. It's an autoregressive model. So due to that reason, uh, so here they have chosen an initial context from the Harry Potter stories. So Harry Potter stories, uh, so they are uh, selected some random uh, two continuous sentences from the Harry Potter story and they provided that as an input to the uh, glove model. And uh, so the glove model, what it will do is it will generate the next word based on the previous context. So suppose for the GPT-2 model, the number of voca like vocabulary size is almost 50,000 words. So, so in the step four, we will get uh, probabilities for all the 50,000 words. So once if we have the uh, probabilities for all the 50,000 words, then uh, for uh, then we also take the uh, representations for all these 50,000 words. Yeah, so in step six, so they use uh, uh, their own proposal loss, which is an anchor loss. So this is like uh, cosine distance between the uh, glow representations from the top five predictions and again um, uh, the 50,000 uh, word rep glove representations and they have adding the probability of each word and the cosine distance. And they are also maintaining a parameter k to balance the probabilities as well as the cosine distance. Yeah, so this is how they are generating the uh, words based on the uh, GPT-2 model. 
Yeah, so uh, finally we have to select a token with the higher probability and we have to send the same token again back to GPT-2 model for generating the next token. And if you can look at the language generation, so this is the initial context they provide to do a GPT-2 model from Harry Potter story and uh, anchor uh, from the classical uh, classification decoder model. These are the all the top five words appeared for prediction and uh, with anchoring. Suppose if we included the anchor loss, so this is how the context generated and if we use without anchor loss, then this is how the uh, context got generated. No, uh, so no fMRI from the Harry Potter. So the only initial context because for GPT-2 model, we have to provide some context to the model. So they are selecting from the Harry Potter stories. So the fMRI, fMRI is from all the, again, uh, it's from Pareda 180 concepts uh, data. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, so in this work, even they try to generate these sentences from the fMRI using uh, GPT-2 based uh, model. Yeah, um, so now, uh, till now we've only focused on the representations. Suppose if we inject some linguistic structure into the model, then whether we get a better decoding accuracy or not, like uh, the linguistic structures are like syntactic or semantic structures. Suppose if I injected into a language model, whether we can get a better decoding performance or not. So does injecting linguistic structure into language models lead to better alignment with the brain recordings? So, neuro, uh, so, so neuroscientists evaluate the, all the deep language models and how uh, these models are associated with the fMRI brain activity using different uh, linear models or nonlinear models. And uh, also prior works have shown that these representations are well associated with the brain recordings. And yeah, so however, modern NLP models are not often trained without explicit linguistic knowledge because uh, all these BERT, GPT-2, all these models, they just provide a raw corpus and uh, self-supervised model, everything learned from the data itself. Um, so that is the reason uh, if we can inject some linguistic structure into the model, whether we can get a better um, brain, uh, whether if we inject some structure, whether uh, it will be better aligned with the brain recordings or not. So the proposed approach is, uh, if we have a uh, Harry Potter uh, story and uh, we have a recorded fMRI. So one model, uh, they are using BERT model. It's a pre-trained uh, BERT model. And if you give the stimulus, uh, we will get the representations. And the second model is altered BERT. Altered BERT means it's a fine-tuned BERT model. But the fine-tuned BERT model is not related to uh, tasks like uh, sentiment analysis or question answering. Rather than, um, so they fine-tuned on the linguistic structure or probing task, like uh, 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 dependency structure or like uh, um, subject-verb agreement. So these are the some linguistic structures. So they fine-tune the model with respect to those kinds of data sets. And so they try to align uh, what is the uh, difference between fine-tuned model and a pre-trained model. So when we, when we fine-tuned with some linguistic structure, is there any extra uh, thing we got in the uh, fine-tuned model compared to the pre-trained model? So we want to check that extra alignment. Yeah, so one is pre-trained and one is fine-tuned and uh, any improvement in the pre-trained versus fine-tuned model. So they mainly focused on uh, three linguistic formalisms. Uh, one is uh, injecting linguistic structure into language models, like, uh, yeah, so one is universal dependencies, like a dependency parser. Yeah, so how one word is related with the other word. So it's like universal dependency relations. And uh, second one is like a, a bilexical dependencies. Uh, it's like mainly we can use for the semantic dependency parsing. So the first one is uh, universal dependencies for the syntactic. And the, the second one is uh, bilexical dependencies mainly for the semantics. Yeah. So the orange one is for the universal and the blue one is for the bilexical dependencies. Yeah, so the third uh, linguistic formula is uh, UCCA, Universal Cognitive Conceptual Annotation. So this is another linguistic formalism they have used. 
Yeah, so for all these uh, three linguistic formalisms, we have the available uh, data sets for uh, every linguistic structure. And uh, yeah, so they have fine tuned uh, these three linguistic structure data sets uh, with the pre-trained pre uh, BERT. And if you can look at these results on the Parira and uh, Vibe data sets. Uh, so here a dotted line is for the uh, pre-trained BERT and uh, solid line is for the uh, fine tuned BERT. Yeah, so here uh, if you can look at these three formalisms, so pre-trained BERT is performing better than the uh, fine tuned BERT both on the uh, Parira and uh, Vibe data sets. So now they further tested subject verb agreement, even for the subject verb agreement also we have a, a, a data set is available. This is a, again linguistic structure data set. For the subject verb agreement also they tried all these uh, three linguistic formalisms. And if you can, yeah. so if you can observe here, so, so now here we can see clearly that uh, domain fine tuned model is performing better the solid line uh, for the sum of the relations like uh, um, like object relation clause or like subject relation clause we have different subject verb agreements here so one is object related and one is a subject relation clause yeah so for each linguistic structure they have tried and a coarse grained semantic class performance, even if you can look at a, a coarse grained level like name identities or like a, a discourse level, temporal level, uh, event level, name identities, logical. Uh, so yeah, for all the three formalisms. So one is at the, uh, so this is at the syntax level and uh, this one is at the semantic level. Yeah, so the, the summary is, um, so from the results we can see that uh, if we can inject some linguistic structure like syntactic or semantic into the language model, where we can see that brain is decoding better compared to the uh, pre-trained uh, BERT model, especially if you can look at the subject verb agreement or if you can look at the coarse grained semantic class performance. Yeah, so, so the last work in uh, linguistic decoding, um, it's a multi-view and uh, cross-view decoding. So we have seen uh, Parira data set experiment one is having three views for the same concept like uh, uh, picture view, sentence view and word cloud view. Now the question is, uh, can we do a multi-view decoding? Like if I train model on picture view, but I will test it on sentence view and uh, word cloud view because uh, the person is watching the same information but in the three different views. So whether the brain recordings will be same or not, if we watch the same concept in three different uh, formats and uh, if I can train model on one view, whether uh, how I will get the uh, representation. So whether I will get the better stimulus representation from the picture view or whether I will get the better representation from the sentence view or the word cloud view. Yeah, so all the uh, existing works uh, like Parira or uh, sentence level decoder, all these works, they have only focused on the uh, single view, like either they model uh, trained on only pictures and tested on pictures, trained on sentences or tested on sentences. But here uh, we trained on pictures but tested on sentence view and uh, word cloud view. Similarly, trained on sentence view and tested on picture and word cloud views. Yeah, so again the, the data set is from the Parira data set, uh, experiment one, we have the uh, three different views. So multi-view decoding, how multi-view decoding works, like uh, in the training we use uh, word uh, apartment of the word cloud view, uh, so that is uh, we provide the informative work cells uh, to the model and uh, during testing time we will take the informative work cells of a picture view and the informative work cells of a word cloud view and we try to uh, get the representation. So, send, uh, so during testing time we can use uh, sentence view work cells and uh, picture view work cells. Similarly, if the picture view is in the training, during testing we have again a picture, sentence and a word cloud view. Yeah, similarly for the sentence view in training, we again we have the three different views in the testing. Yeah, so again uh, the same data set. Yeah, now if we can look at the results, if we train a picture view and if we can uh, test it on the uh, all the three views, so obviously uh, the same view 
always get a better decoding accuracy and if you can also look at the sentence view sentence view also have a better decoding performance um, so the we have uh, we have tested with uh, even bird and uh, shuffled bird shuffled bird means uh, so suppose if you have an apartment and it's a corresponding uh, uh, representation but we shuffled it like for apartment we will get the uh, like a insect and uh, insect representation so we provide a random shuffling of bird and we train the model for the random shuffling we can see that the performance got dropped so so only if you provide a proper representations then only the better decode we will get a better decoding performance if you provide a simple random vector or random shuffling of uh, representations so obviously the performance or chance level is low yeah so we have both pairwise accuracy as well as rank accuracy uh, again we if we train a model on sentence view and we tested on all the views now if you can see here if we train if we train a model on the sentence view and you can see the decoding performance we can clearly see that even from the sentence view also we can get a better decoding performance at the picture view yeah even at the word cloud view yeah and suppose if you train model only on the word cloud view and tested on remaining three views um, so you can see that word cloud view is uh, we are getting better decoding performance only at the sentence view not from the word cloud view and also if you observe um, so the we are getting better decoding performance word cloud view in at the sentence view not from the word cloud view so the sentence is getting a better uh, sentence model is a better model compared to the uh, word cloud model if you are uh, giving some sentence or something yeah so pictures best accuracy then uh, sentence best accuracy both in the sentence view and uh, yeah in word cloud view now if you can look at the distribution of informative voxels now we did a, a better job uh, rather than just looking at the language visual uh, dm and task positive even we went to uh, different uh, language left hemisphere language right hemisphere even in the vision we have vision body vision face vision scene uh, we have even sub region level informative voxels now if you can see here language left hemisphere is having higher informative voxels coming to coming compared to the right hemisphere and uh, in the vision uh, we can see that most informative voxels coming from the vision object, vision face and vision body compared to vision scene because in the Parira data set all the concepts are related to concrete nouns or abstract words and no scenes are involved in the data set and uh, so every word just uh, they have to imagine so we can see that object region voxels are high compared to the scene informative voxels. Yeah, even we have uh, yeah in DMN and uh, task positive. So in DMN we can see that uh, so since it's a semantic representation related, so we can see that most informative voxels coming from the sentence view compared to the picture or word cloud view. Now if we go to the subregion level of the language network, uh, so like uh, um, yeah in subregion level for the each view, if we can see the uh, most informative voxels are coming from the middle temporal gyrus or uh, posterior temporal gyrus or angular gyrus so here we are not we are not giving any a priori knowledge to the model so we are just selecting the voxels based on the representations and if you can see that all the voxels are coming from the language area and specifically again middle temporal gyrus and uh, posterior temporal gyrus and if you can look at the visual network again the sub regions of the visual network uh, so the most informative voxels are coming from uh, location so uh, LOC, uh, so it's like a lateral occipital uh, area and uh, body area. So the voxels are coming only from these regions compared to the uh, remaining sub regions. We don't have any informative voxels at all. Yeah, so face area because there are some words which are related to faces, some words related to uh, like apartment. So it's object related. So yeah so it's all about multi view decoding uh, we also did a, a cross view decoding so in case of cross view decoding rather than just using the uh, concept views now uh, suppose if we give an image a picture view can we get the uh, caption of that particular uh, image or can we get the uh, keywords from that particular uh, image so in cross view decoding in train we will give the picture view 
fmri response and in the testing we are uh, uh, giving the its a caption of the particular image and the second view uh, second is like uh, image tagging image tagging is like if i give an image uh, can you tag the image like in tagging we need to give what are all the objects are present in that particular image so this is like a image tagging task um, so then the third one is a uh, um, sentence formation if i give the word cloud you can you formulate this sentence based on the words and it's a semantically related words it's a sentence formation view task so in the third fourth one is uh, sentence view so here keyword extraction so if we give a, a sentence to sentence view at the model and uh, we want a keywords uh, like uh, suppose if you have a sentence a small red bird sitting on a snow covered ground so from this we will need to extract the keywords like uh, bird snow ground red something so this is a uh, sentence uh, keyword extraction now if we can look at the uh, cross view decoding results again for the bird and uh, randomly shuffled uh, features of bird uh, we can clearly see that image captioning image tagging and keyword extractions are working well compared to the sentence formation because sentence formation is a, a bit difficult task compared to the remaining three tasks yeah and if even if we can look at the distribution of informative voxels uh, yeah, we can clearly see that language left hemisphere is having more informative voxels com compared to the right hemisphere and also the object, especially if you can look at image captioning and image tagging, these two are related to image related and uh, keyword extraction and sentence formation are related to sentence view. Um, so the object related informative voxels mainly from the image captioning and image tagging compared to there are no informative voxels for the keyword extraction or sentence formation task. Uh, yeah so if you can look at the even the sub regions of the language network uh, here also you can see that keyword extraction and sentence form uh, keyword extraction is also related to uh, mainly for the uh, it's related to language and even sentence formation is also related to language so the most informative voxels especially for the keyword extraction uh, coming in the uh, middle temporal or posterior temporal gyrus and if you can look at the uh, ATG anterior temporal gyrus the voxels are only present in the linguistic task no voxels are present in the image captioning or image tagging task here we didn't provide any information at all, at all to the model that pick these voxels so all these voxels are coming from the representations itself Yeah, even for the visual network, if you see that again, so for the visual network, the only informative voxels coming um, for the image captioning and image tagging from the uh, LOC area and the EBA area, whereas for the keyword extraction and sentence formation, there are no informative voxels in the LOC area. Yeah, so this, this is all about uh, linguistic uh, decoding. Um, if you have any questions. Any questions? No Zoom? Okay. Yeah, so then we can continue with our last, last subtopic, uh, vision brain decoding. Yeah, so in vision brain decoding, um, I'm only covering one work because most of the vision related brain decodings are like uh, image reconstruction. So like if for uh, uh, doing the image reconstruction, some people you have used GAN model, some people have used autoencoder models, but their ultimate goal is they want to do a image reconstruction or video reconstruction from the fMRI. Uh, yes, self-supervision um, in uh, natural image reconstruction from fMRI. Yeah. So, yeah, in case of uh, vision decoding, reconstructing observed images from fMRI uh, is a challenging task because here we have to take the voxels of visual cortex and I want to reconstruct the whole image back. It's a very difficult task just taking the voxels of uh, uh, visual cortex and it's also depend upon the, the model you are using. Um, suppose if you use a good uh, 
vision model, then you can get a better reconstruction. Uh, it's, it's also depend on the model you are using. So one problem is uh, labeled data. So we don't have a, a good amount of uh, labeled data for the vision task. Yeah, limited uh, time, uh, human spending, and uh, MRI scanner. Because if we want a uh, uh, good data set, then the person have to spend more time in the MRI scanner. Like if he spend more time, then we'll get a more uh, amount of data. And uh, most data sets are limited to few thousands or uh, such examples like uh, uh, we have bunch of data sets for the language but uh, we don't have uh, those many data sets similarly for the vision um, so whatever their data sets are available only have few uh, hundreds examples like 500 examples or 200 examples yeah, we have some data sets, uh, bold 5000 data set, uh, bold 5000 data set, uh, we have 5000 images in the data set and some images from the ImageNet, some images from the Coco and some images from the scenes and uh, SSF MRI, uh, it's like a, in this particular data set, uh, there are total 1250 images from the ImageNet and 1000 images they used for training, uh, not 1000, 1200 images they used for training and uh, 50 images they used for testing. And Vim1 data set, uh, it contains 1870 images and all these images are like a, a binary, it's a, just a grayscale images. So it's not even color images, RGB. Yeah. So reconstructing uh, visual stimulus, uh, yeah, yeah, in the classical works, like, uh, yeah, so, so yeah, we can divide uh, these Visual reconstruction uh, from the fMRI, we can divide it into three categories. Uh, one is a uh, linear regression based models, like in uh, linear regression based models, uh, so we can uh, use a uh, classical model features like a uh, Gabor filter, if we apply Gabor filter on the image and we can extract some features and uh, using those features, again, uh, we'll try to decode the image. Yeah, so uh, this is like a, a Gabor filter model where we give the image to a Gabor filter and we will get the uh, representations and uh, if we give fMRI at the input and we'll try to decode the uh, representation back. So the second category of models like uh, again uh, linear regression between fMRI and uh, deep image features. So rather than taking the uh, Gabor filter features, now we will take the features from the CNN models. Like if you give an image to CNN, we'll get the representations and uh, the for the ridge regression, now the input is from the fMRI and output is from the deep CNNs. So the, the representations. Yeah, so the, yeah, uh, the third category of models like end-to-end uh, -end deep learning, end-to-end -end deep learning means, uh, so suppose if I give an image and uh, I try to reconstruct the image back, it's like an end-to-end -end model. Uh, in, in case of end-to-end -end model, suppose if you have an image, we have a fMRI brain activity and if you give this fMRI brain activity to uh, deep, uh, deep neural network with a GAN based model where GAN assumes uh, it pick uh, some image from a, a random distribution and uh, yeah, we, uh, so like uh, it's a generator and a discriminator and like that so it's, it optimizes the model. Yeah, and also we have a uh, DCNN GANs, like uh, if you have a uh, uh, fMRI and uh, yeah, we have an encoder, we have an output, so yeah. So here also it's a GAN based model. Yeah, most of the vision reconstruction models are based on the, uh, like uh, either from the GAN model or autoencoder based models. Yeah, image reconstruction from fMRI, yeah, so image features, linear models, or like if you use uh, deep learning based models, yeah non-linear models. Yeah, so this is the work uh, I'm going to talk, uh, self-supervision in natural image reconstruction from fMRI. So what exactly they did here? So we have an uh, SSFMRI data set, uh, which consists of 1250 images, where 1250 images for training and 50 images for testing. So they, they have followed a method called encoder, decoder, encoder. Initially, we have to develop a supervised model. So in case of supervised model, we will give fMRI at the input and we'll try to get the it's a representation of the uh, image. So it's a decoder model, simple decoder model. 
and uh, in case of encoder model we will give the uh, same image representation and we will get the fmri activity so once if we have this supervised encoder and decoder models are there yeah so then uh, what we have to do is we have to do uh, unsupervised training with uh, unlabeled data so here one task is like a uh, encoder decoder model in case of encoder decoder model where the image we are giving it to uh, encoder model and we will get the uh, fmri activity now that fmri activity we will give to decoder model and we will get the representation of image so this is like a end to end training similarly a uh, decoder encoder model where we will give the fmri at the input to a decoder we will get the stimulus representation now the same stimulus representation we will give to encoder and we will get the fmri representation back so one is encoder decoder model and second one is decoder encoder model yeah so once if we have uh, encoder decoder and decoder encoder is ready yeah so we can uh, reconstruct the image like that so the data set they have used uh, again ssfmri data set yeah and uh, yes they consider only the 4500 on voxels from the visual cortex yeah this is the one of the point i am talking about why i have to take only the voxels from the visual cortex so when the subject is watching only that is the area only get activated uh, we are not getting any properties at all uh, because we are just reconstructing the image what about the properties the what the person is thinking yeah and they also test it on the vim1 data set like yeah it's all grayscale images yeah encoder encoder is like images to fmri and the architecture they have used is a cnn arch uh, alexnet architecture yeah and the last function is like uh, yeah so r minus r2 is like uh, yeah uh, it's like a reconstruction image uh, so r is like a original representation and r is like a predicted representation and uh, they are also finding the cosine distance between these two representations and alpha is the parameter controlling both loss functions yeah so this is the fmri loss because here we are reconstructing the fmri yeah so msc loss one is a, uh, actual fmri response and uh, yeah one is a predicted fmri response similarly we have a cosine similarity now from fmri to images it's like a decoder yeah again the architecture is same alexnet architecture and uh, the loss is like a, one is a rgb loss and one is again features loss so loss uh, image on like rgb values and loss on the image features so image features from the cnn model and rgb values are like just a pixel values and we have also a regularization parameter to control the overfitting yeah, yeah so finally we can uh, combine encoder decoder uh, like yeah so i already explained unsupervised way how we can do encoder decoder and also a decoder encoder yeah so if you can look at the results so one is a ground truth image first column and second column is the one i have talked about end to end deep image reconstruction using a gan model and the third column is uh, representing the uh, self supervised uh, way of uh, reconstruction and if you can see uh, that yeah at least we can see some pattern in the uh, self supervised uh, model compared to the deep image uh, recon end to end reconstruction with the gan yeah but still it's not clear like uh, the original image reconstruction with the models uh, so they also uh, check the chance level like a two way five way ten way two way means we will only pick the top two images top two categories uh, five way means like we we can select up to five images uh, five predicted images or like ten way means we can go up to ten images to compare the performance with the original performance yeah so the even um, yeah these are some more uh, comparisons with the previous methods yeah shen at all so like end to end model yeah two way five way and 10 way um, yeah their method is self supervised model is performing better than the uh, gan model yeah so these are all the references um, yeah if i miss any references yeah please ping me yeah yeah i think that's all for the brain decoding
so if you have any questions uh, till here Yeah. And so what's to enforce the model to actually use the uh, the neural representation for reconstruction? It seems like it could just learn to construct any image that is convincible or convincing. Uh, uh, what exactly here reconstruction is like? Um, so the from fMRI recording, so the output is uh, normally the CNN representation because every layer, if we give a uh, image, we will get a representation at uh, each layers from the CNN. Now what they are doing is, um, so now that is the representation, they are giving it to the uh, uh, loss, like uh, because uh, for the GAN model, the generator uh, from the random noise, it generates some image and uh, that image they are giving it to the CNN model to get the representations and uh, we have a uh, predicted representations from the fMRI and they try to minimize the loss. So that is how they are uh, reconstructing the image. Any further questions? Yeah, uh, okay, so if you have, if you don't have any questions, maybe we can, sh yeah. Sorry, I'm hogging the time. Uh, yeah. Has, has anyone ever done some sort of uh, decoding to, to see, like comparing um, the mental abilities of like a five-year-old versus, a, versus, you know, like a, a professor or something like that to see uh, the decodability of some sort of concept? Uh, <laughs> I think no. There, there are some work from uh, Peter Kumar called Jump. Uh, so he did some work on um, having experts in I think physics and PhD students, like professors in physics, PhD students in physics, and undergrads in physics, uh, and trying to get them to explain some kind of physics concepts and then decoding in the brain. Um, I, I do remember some, some work in that. So yeah, Marcel Jump. Um, so normally um, in the current neuroscience community uh, people are focusing on encoding because uh, they want to interpret uh, how brain captures um, uh, linguistic structure and how language model captures linguistic structure because brain decoding is still uh, not a correctly defined problem. Suppose if I have fMRI uh, but if I decode stimulus what I will get? from that but rather than if I can decode some properties of a person that this is how the person uh, thinking about this particular uh, stimulus or image uh, like yeah so if I can decode the properties not only just the reconstructing the image so in that case decoding is a good problem but yes so one need to define the decoding problem clearly what exactly they want. So, but the encoding problem is uh, well defined, yeah, so people are working good in that area, encoding. Uh, even in the like uh, bilingualism, like if two people are good at uh, two languages and when a person is reading the two, uh, like if a person is reading something in one language, can we decode the other language? Uh, is it really uh, a good problem to solve if we decode in the other language? Yeah. Brain computer interface. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, there are works related to EEG brain decoding, but uh, my area of research is completely on the fMRI, so that is why I focus mostly on fMRI. Yeah, but there are some works uh, which are related to EEG brain decoding.
Um, I think uh, in terms of performance uh, with fMRI, we have a better decoding performance compared to EEG. Uh, that is why uh, people always mostly towards uh, fMRI level compared to the EEG level because uh, suppose uh, if we take a TR level, let's say if you are listening a story and uh, we have a TR level fMRI data and uh, if you want to reconstruct the stimulus because in encoding we did the down sampling thing and we want to match the TR alignment like uh, we concatenated uh, some six TR representations and we have the seventh TR fMRI response. What we can do in decoding like if I take a, a seventh TR fMRI response and uh, if you want the six TR stimulus representations what about the, the initial uh, six fMRIs so it doesn't have any information at all because we are decoding right yeah. So especially in the temporal data, um, I didn't find many, maybe I have found only one, two works who took the uh, TR level data to decode it, but they have followed the same way like uh, they took the some uh, i3TR uh, data and they try to get the stimulus representations up to I minus one. Is there uh, any decoding work that yeah, any deco that? yeah, so most of these decoding works, suppose if you are working for a linguistic decoding, they focus on the language area work cells. Suppose if you are working for a vision decoding, they have to focus on the uh, visual area work cells. Yeah, all these works, they have specifically focused on these particular areas. But it's never like isolate my language network and someone else's language network and decode from the idiosyncrasies of our networks. Um, so um, in that case, like, uh, so it's, it's a subject level decoding like uh, if I train model on uh, one person and if we can testing like in testing time we can give the other person uh, works. I think this works already did people. Yeah, yeah. and, and how, how do people like share information then across is it literally one model for every person or do people have some kind of joint model that can relax that assumption about uh, so they, the uh, one can do is like we can do a, a shared response uh, model like uh, among all these um, 10 subjects fMRI data we can project into one single space and uh, there we can develop a single model for all these uh, subjects. But still like uh, if whatever you are thinking and whatever I am thinking it's completely different. So if, uh, if you, you decode something okay these two people this is the reconstruction. So that's not meaningful because you have some properties and I have some properties and if I decode those properties then it will be a good problem. Yeah. So along those lines, um, for the BERT scramble, uh, the one that was pre trained on scramble of words, yeah. so that it had better, better performance for decoding. Yeah. Um, I, so the metric that you used, did that allow for rotations in the space? Or, like, uh, the, exactly how were you measuring performance there? Um, no. Um, so to measure the performance, again, they have used a mean squared error. So, uh, so for fine tuning rather than providing the raw corpus, now you are providing the scrambled corpus. So once if you fine tune the model, now you provide the, uh, again, um, whatever the stimulus you have corresponding fMRI representation, you present the stimulus to scrambled language model and you are taking the representations and uh, you are giving fMRI at the input and you are predicting the representation and the metric is MSC loss like a mean squared error between predicted representation and the representation coming from the scramble language model rather than the uh, original uh, pre-trained model. So the loss is simple MSE loss so they have used. Yeah. Uh, no, um, so the thing is uh, the representations maybe we can add some uh, random noise or like we can do some sort of uh, permutations on the uh, uh, representations um, like perturbing the representation so that's what we can do. Yeah, because uh, shuffling the representations is difficult right like if you have the vector what you can shuffle from the vector. Yeah, because whether you shuffled it or not, it's a simple ridge regression model and every feature dimension you are having a weight. 
yeah so no matter where the representation number is yeah So if you don't have any questions, yeah, then we can move to hands-on session. Thank you. Yeah.